There are epigenetic changes which occur based on this fetal, this fetal experience during pregnancy, effects on the telomeres. And again, what I like about this uh, diagram is that there are also, the diagram also not only talks about what are the risks when a fetus has, uh, experiences a lot of stress through the mom, but what might we do? It also suggests potential interventions, stress buffering factors. What about nutrition? And again, the way I think this field is going is a, a look at how do we, as mental health professionals, with our particular skills in helping women cope, in helping with behavior management, how do we help then have an optimal pregnancy given the restrictions that are there? So again, another factor that's influencing how this field has come to think about what we do when we see a pregnant patient. So how big is this problem? I think many people now realize that perinatal depression is an incredibly common disorder. So we did a study in uh, Pittsburgh with, in which we went to the women's hospital and we screened 10,000 women. McGee Women's Hospital has a pretty broad uh, population base, not a lot of African Americans, but a lot of rural as well as urban uh, women came to that particular hospital. They do 10,000 deliveries a year. We did this study over several years. And what we did was we went to the delivery unit and I hired nurses and social workers who were already employed there to work two hours extra a day. And as well as uh, a separate study in which we offered them a care manager for a year. But what we found in this study was that uh, about one, the 14%, one out of seven women screened positive at four to six weeks postpartum. That's pretty consistent with other data collected uh, in this area. And when we asked them, when did this episode that you're screening positive for, the set of symptoms that you have, when did it begin? True to the epidemiology of this illness, where we know that the postpartum is a high-risk period, about 40% of women said, this started right after I gave birth. So true by DSM, the old postpartum definition, within four weeks of birth. About a third of women said, this episode began sometime in the nine months of my pregnancy, and about a, a quarter said, this is long-term prior to pregnancy. So if you screen, postpartum, you have a group of patients with variable onsets. And so we then recommended screening at the first OB appointment and at four to six weeks postpartum based on these data because we'd like to pick up those patients earlier. And in fact, at our hospital, perinatal depression screening in Illinois is legally mandated. So they're screened first, third trimesters, and postpartum. So uh, again, a, a sense of how common these disorders are. These are the, this is the spread of the EPDS scores. So 10 is a research cutoff. That's what we used. So about 14% positive. If you use a clinical cutoff, more commonly 13, 7% of women screen positive, unless you screen in a high-risk sample. So for example, when we were working with Healthy Start, about 30 to 40 percent of those women screened positive, even at 13. So, you may have to adjust for your sample. When we looked at the diagnoses in these patients, I was uh, somewhat disheartened, and and I'll tell you why in a, in a minute. I mean, we found what we thought we would that the diagnoses that the women were experiencing were primarily mood disorders. But what I was not quite prepared for was that the majority of the women that we were seeing had recurrent depressions, often two or three episodes in their lives, even before a child, even if it was a first birth. So we're looking at recurrent major depression that we were picking up postpartum, 
Not only that, we looked at comorbidities, and the majority of those women, probably about 70%, described an early onset anxiety disorder in childhood or adolescence that sort of heralded a depressive episode. So in some of the work that I'm doing now, I actually am now doing a puberty clinic to go back to my child psychiatry roots to look at that time in adolescence when the difference between the depression rate in females versus males doubles because I'm hoping we can do something to you know, develop programs to implement early on so that by the time these women have kids, they're not already having recurrent depressive episodes on top of anxiety <laughs> disorders. The other finding here was that in screen positive women in the postpartum period, about 22% had bipolar disorder when we did the skid. That was alarming. We know that the postpartum period is often a time for the first episode of mania, or in many of our women, uh, they, they had mixed states as well. And mixed states in particular are somewhat difficult to diagnose in that time. So I then began to be concerned about the screening that we were recommending. So um, what was happening is you recommend screening. Screening is implemented in primary care settings and obstetrical settings where these patients are seen. They screen positive on the EPDS. The clinician, who is often not a mental health professional, does a checklist. Yes, they have the symptoms of major depression. They get put on an SSRI. We had a horrible experience in which, uh, it, it, this was actually in Pittsburgh, in which the uh, patient was put on an SSRI, 50 milligrams of sertraline, was seen two weeks later. She was worse, which was identified as uh, the drug has too low a dose. It takes a while to work. The dose was increased to 50 milligrams. And two days later, she committed suicide by hanging in her basement. What I feel badly about is I think that we haven't taken enough care to educate people who are screening about bipolar illness and that the, the, in prescribing the medications, this period is particularly vulnerable and that we need to think carefully about adding some type of assessment for bipolarity. So what we did was we added the MDQ, the Mood Disorders Questionnaire, for, to the EPDS and studied the capacity of the MDQ in the post-birth period to uh, pick up cases of bipolar disorder as, uh, as uh, diagnosed by the SCID. And so this is the MDQ, uh, the familiar screening measure. You'll see X's here, and I'll explain that in a minute. But basically, it's a lifetime and current screen for the symptoms of mania. It's really helpful, again, for non-mental health professionals to have a measure like this to work with. It takes extra time, but it's only you know, a few items, and it doesn't take that much time. The critical elements here, I think, are blood relatives with bipolar disorder and whether the patient's been told she had bipolar disorder. The very sad case of the woman that I told you about who committed suicide had a mother with bipolar disorder, and that was never recognized as part of the treatment planning. So when we looked at if we couple the MDQ and the EPDS and we screen a population of patients, how effective was the MDQ? And we were just looking at screen positivity, which we defined in this population of EPDS greater than 10, where we gave, <clears throat> we gave the MDQ. What we found was that the MDQ identified 50% of the patients who had bipolar disorder with the standard seven items are positive and the degree of impairment item. The uh, item that I crossed out here is, in fact, the degree of impairment. What we found was if we just ignored that item altogether, 70% of the patients who had bipolar disorder were identified on the MDQ, and that's in part because patients often don't identify the degree of difficulty or impairment they have with less, um, with uh, some of the stages, especially hypomania, early mania, and they can lose insight. So that is our recommendation for uh, screening. Either screen with the EPDS, but before you prescribe, 
do the MDQ or screen with both. That's being implemented in a few places, but is fairly new in terms of a practice recommendation. So what, what about this idea of getting more information about women's health? There is now a cross-federal agency committee, PREGLAC, it's the Task Force on Research Specific to Pregnant Women and Lactating Women, and this is the group that says we need to identify gaps in research. So this group includes DHHS, FDA, all the NIH institutes, CDC, cross-government meetings. There have been three. The fourth one is coming up in May. And the plan is that a document will be generated with areas of priority for investigation to um, guide the treatment of pregnant women on major difficulties, on major medical problems that they have, both, again, in pregnancy and in the during breastfeeding as well. So. It's a uh, effort to begin to do some policy change on what I have as a title here. Pregnant women get sick and sick women get pregnant and we don't have a lot of data about treatment. So what happens to women if they're on maintenance antidepressants and they uh, become pregnant? So this is an older study that was done, again, in an academic setting where the women are probably at pretty high risk for recurrence. And what was shown was that if the women discontinued their medication proximal to conception, they had about a two out of three chance of suffering a recurrence, and the recurrence was rapid. If the women maintained treatment in pregnancy, about a quarter of the women suffered a recurrence. And that's a significant difference. But my response to this publication is, wow, why do these women get sick? I mean, uh, the women that I work with don't really respond very well if I say to them, gee, you know, your chance of becoming ill in pregnancy if you continue your medication is one out of four. And I, I think that, uh, I, I believe I have uh, an, an explanation for that, but I'll leave that till a little bit later. So another myth that we have is women don't take any medications in pregnancy. So these are data from the birth defect survey by Alan Mitchell's group in Boston. And essentially what he did was he tracked what is the rate of um, medication taking from 1976 through 2006? What happens to the number of medications that women take across time? So you're looking at the mean number of medications that are increasing across time so that at this point, almost all women had taken at least one medication. These are an average number of medications, one going to two and a half, taken in the first trimester. And these are the percent of women taking four or more at any time, four or more in the first trimester across time. So women are taking medications, and this is not iron and multivitamins. This is medications for pain, medications to treat hyperemesis, medications for hypertension, for cardiac problems medications needed to treat uh, asthma, seizures, to treat disorders that women have in pregnancy. So this, this is often a, a shocking uh, slide, but it's something that was published now in 2011. The piece of this paper that's particularly interesting to us is this, which is antidepressants are some of the most commonly prescribed medications. And you can see antidepressants as a class coming up to 8% at this point. And we have SSRIs as a subgroup, and uh, sertraline, fluoxetine, and citalopram, escitalopram separately graphed there. And sertraline is almost always the most commonly used uh, medication in pregnancy. The graph's a little misleading. 8% of women do not continue their meds in pregnancy. They're exposed. But about 2 to 2.5% 2 of women choose to continue the SSRI in pregnancy. So in interpreting this literature, in asking the question, how can we untangle the effects of the SSRI, which is given for a disorder from outcomes? And the early papers in this area were papers that uh, often looked at an SSRI 
and the group of women who took the SSRI, the outcomes were compared to women who didn't take an SSRI, where it showed the SSRI had an association with whatever negative outcome there was. And the, the responses came to be, well, you know, but SSRIs are not given to well women. They're given to women with serious mood disorders. And probably those women who take it have more serious mood disorders than many. So what about the disease state? And that's led to uh, a, a very interesting set of developments in pharmacoepidemiology with fairly sophisticated ways to uh, look at confounding variables and begin to separate as, as best one can in an observational study. There aren't randomized studies. There are observational studies where there are clearly factors that differ between women who take medication and women who don't in pregnancy. So these confounds that you know, are associated with depression, which is associated with SSRI treatment, and their relationship to outcomes has been a big topic of discussion over the last three decades in this area, and some very uh, good success in terms of sorting out what is the magnitude of confounding. Some very interesting papers have been published. So with that frame, I'll talk about my opinion about what we know about these areas of investigation. I always I remind myself. <laughs> okay, so what about birth defects, physical malformations? I use a, a quote from Michael Green here, uh, who is an obstetrician gynecologist. He wrote an interesting editorial in the New England Journal, somewhat um, uh, titled Teratogenicity of SSRI, Serious Concern or Much Ado About Little. Uh, that sort of t is kind of his personality that he would make that title. But I think this has held the test of time. Specific defects, if any, are rare and the absolute risks are small. And I think the if any is important in there because in this field, uh, from about 10 to 20 years ago, there was this pressure to say, do these drugs cause birth defects or not? As if this is a dichotomous kind of finding, and if we did more studies, we'd figured that out, but it's not knowable. The best we can do is the if any, meaning the level of risk is so small it approaches none. We can't ever prove that there's absolutely no risk, and then you get into on what outcome. Here we're talking specifically about birth defects, but we all know there are many outcomes through life that could be associated with early exposures. And the evidence uh, more recently for uh, Dr. Green's statement is a paper by uh, Krista Hybrex, a pharmacoepidemiologist at Harvard, in which she did this incredibly interesting study with a large Medicaid population, and she looked at what is the relationship between SSRI exposure first trimester and birth defects, particularly cardiac defects, in a population of SSRI versus unexposed? Then she said, I want to know what the risk is in a population of SSRI-treated women who have major depressive disorder only versus non-treated women who have major depression only, so restricting by diagnosis. Then she did propensity score matching, so she w then pulled out strata of patients. So, for example, you might, you might say, I want to know what is, the, um, what is the association if an obese woman with MDD takes an SSRI compared to an obese woman who uh, doesn't take an SSRI with MDD. So, Strata allowing you to compare more similar patients across, uh, you know, when you're doing these kinds of comparisons, which is, uh, again, a more sophisticated analysis, and it takes a fairly large population. So what was really interesting is if you just look at SSRIs versus the, a population of unexposed, you get a significant result, again, which was characteristic of the early literature in this area. If you look at what about the women who had MDD only, you restrict the diagnosis, you can see the odds ratio comes down, includes one, so it's not significant, but it's reduced, implying that there are confounding factors that are pulled out with these populations. So if she did the propensity score matching in the major depressive disorder group, the odds ratio is non-significant, and in fact, 
she conducted two other uh, assessments because these were had previously been thought in case control studies to be relate, related, but they were not related in this larger investigation either. This paper was used as evidence to support the um, a federal judge's uh, opinion to uh, close the class action suits against Pfizer for its drug sertraline uh, being associated with cardiac defects. So this has had a huge impact on the literature as has, uh, and Dr. Hybrex has a number of papers on other psychotropics in pregnancy that are worth reading as well. Just to display what she did uh, graphically, so one, of course, here is, you know, not significant. There's no difference between the two groups you're comparing. So if you have this, which is unadjusted, SSRI treated, not SSRI treated, all of these relationships between these drugs and cardiac defects are significant. With the depression restricted, only major depression, depression with SSRI treatment, depression without, the odds ratios are moving here towards one, with the propensity score matching, none of these are significant. So again, a, a very interesting and important paper in our literature. I wanted to uh, make sure everybody is aware of this resource, Mother to Baby, formerly Organization of Teratology Information Specialists. These are folks who are uh, private and publicly funded. They have DHHS funded to be, be available to women and practitioners for information about any drug, not just psychotropics, but any drug, any combination of drugs in pregnancy. And they have uh, data from registries that isn't published yet to share also. So uh, they have live chat. Uh, these I've been working with them for about 15 years now. They're a wonderful group, really uh, active and helping companies write the new PDR labels, you know, the new uh, FDA uh, labels for drugs, which have new requirements for helping write those. But they have fact sheets. So you can find any of our antidepressants, a fact sheet on it during pregnancy. Notice it says in every pregnancy, there's a three to five chance of a baby with a birth defect. These are educational sheets written around the eighth grade level that you can hand to patients. And importantly, you can hand them out for the disease state as well. So what about preterm birth? Uh, this, uh, we, we were uh, studying this uh, in the mid-2000s here uh, in a study in which we were looking at women who were medicated completely throughout pregnancy. So these were women that said, I can't stop my drug. I get too sick. I'm taking it all through pregnancy. So exposed all through pregnancy, we had a group of women with depression who said, I'm not taking any medication. And then we had this comparison group completely well. And as you'd expect, this group did well with a 6% risk for preterm birth. These two groups were roughly equivalent, 23 and 21% with preterm birth. So we began to, to wonder, you know, is there some trait effect of depression? What is it about either having depression that's medicated or depression that's not medicated? What is this about? And uh, we uh, also have Hybrex data the, from the paper that I just showed you in which she found a similar thing in that if you look at preterm birth for SSRI exposed versus no SSRI exposure during pregnancy, you get this effect of, oh yeah, the, the SSRI is associated with preterm birth. However, if you do that matching again, look at only depression and, only and do the propensity score technique, the relationship is similar. So there's something you know, about depression, and certainly depression has been associated with preterm birth. The question that's not answered yet is, what if the SSRI-treated women are treated fully, complete remission, is the preterm birth reduced? But we have a hint at that. And this is a, a publication in American Journal done with uh, collaborators here at Columbia. 
And this is an interesting paper that suggests what I was just speaking about, that in this population, SSRI treatment in pregnancy conferred a lower risk for late and early preterm birth and C-section. So, you know, the odds ratios here are lower than one, more favorable in a treated population. Now, is that the SSRI or is there something about those patients who take it? Are they more educated, more resourced, have more access? This is Scandinavian, so at least we know they have access, unlike a lot of our populations where access is a problem. But it begins to hint at something we hope is true, that when we prescribe that medication for that woman, at least that individual woman, that her outcome for herself and her baby will be improved. So uh, the other issue in this paper is one that uh, it, it has garnered a lot of interest recently, which is neonatal <laughs> complications. SSRI-treated uh, mothers tend to have babies who have a higher rate of uh, admission to NICUs as well as lo lower APGAR scores. And this thing that we call neonatal adaptation, uh, it's got so many names. We call it neonatal adaptation. Some people call it neonatal withdrawal. Some people call it neonatal discontinuation. We called it adaptation because we didn't want to assume what the mechanism was. Now, early in uh, the, back in the 90s, Tina Chambers published a paper that showed that if a mom took fluoxetine in pregnancy, that her offspring was, about, about a third of those offspring had these neonatal signs, restlessness, rigidity, and tremor, and it was significantly higher than an unexposed group. And this was particularly in the latter part of pregnancy near term that the exposure occurs. We wrote a paper in 2005 which uh, pretty much summarizes how this literature stands. There has been very little progress in understanding what these signs are about. And what I mean by that is uh, the, the mechanisms are not clear, and, and we're hopeful for a grant that we submitted to be funded because there's evidence that the initial signs, <laughs> restlessness, rigidity, tremor, feeding difficulties, these things, certainly more common in SSRI-exposed infants, is that serotonin syndrome, is it increased serotonergic tone in the newborn? So our colleague Amy Salisbury has done fetal studies which suggest that it's not just after birth, that, it's, that these signs may start in, in fetuses. So implying again that it may be a hyperserotonergic effect. Giddy Corin published data um, in Toronto, published data in which he mapped declining venlafaxine levels, concentrations in an infant, to the evolution of signs across time and made the case that this is drug withdrawal. There are other uh, studies, and, and one that we think about, particularly with signs in fetuses, that perhaps it is uh, an effect on the brain, either physiologically or structurally, that we are seeing both during pregnancy and in the post-birth period. And the idea that the duration is short, don't worry about it, just a couple of weeks, isn't proving to be true either. And this is complicated, but it's easy, and I'll tell you why it's easy. So <laughs> the orange, this is a, a bunch of lines. The orange is no exposure. And what we're looking at are a set of signs from the, the NICU behavioral scale, the, the neonatal scale, arousal, attention, excitability, stress signs. So these are all signs in newborns across the first 30 days post-birth, done by a blinded observer by um, my colleague Amy Salisbury. The orange line is no exposure to drug or disease. So those are the babies that are sort of the ideals. <clears throat> so any of these signs, you can look at what's the deviation from the orange. You'll see that green SSRI and benzos is always the farthest away from the orange. The depression is blue and the SSRIs are red. So you can see that here something like attention, 
at, at day 30 is not the same as unexposed. Habituation for all three groups that are benzo, SSRI, depressed group are declining at 30 while the unexposed kids are increasing. So depending on what particular sign or set of signs you're evaluating, the idea that they're gone by 30 days or by two weeks isn't holding true. The other issue is the, this very clear finding of worse neonatal behavior with benzos calls into question this whole literature because the vast majority of publications never report on medication exposure besides, in addition to SSRIs. And uh, not only that, they, you know, we find that a lot of our, no, I'm not taking any other meds, moms uh, have positive urine screens for benzos. So, um, it, it's, again, a literature that needs a, a lot of work and clarification. So what about mental and motor development? Irina Noman did this interesting study in which she looked at exposed and unexposed SIBs, so discord, SIBs discordant for SSRI exposure. And it's a small sample, but what she reported was uh, the full-scale IQs of the discordant twins did not significantly differ, were normal. There was no difference in those, um, in the discordant, not, not twins, discordant SIBs, no difference in the rate of problems in the SIBs. And they uh, looked back to what about the depression in pregnancy? Did that have any predictive potential? And they found that internalizing and externalizing and total uh, scores on the CBCL were related to maternal depression during pregnancy. Again, a small sample, but an interesting way to look at this. We did what I think is uh, still the only longitudinal study in which we looked at Bailey's across the uh, first uh, 78 weeks uh, sequentially after birth. We had blind raters, and we did do uh, UDSs both at intake in pregnancy and at the end of pregnancy because we wanted to make sure we were looking at the effects of SSRI and depression exposures. Again, relatively small samples, but what we found was interesting. Consistent with the literature, mental development, cognitive development was no, difference, was no different at all between the uh, exposures. What had been reported before was that there seems to be an effect between six months and a year on motor development. So uh, things like fine motor skills or delays in, on, uh, in the average time to which a child sits or walks, those kinds of delays. And uh, we were seeing this as well. Now, these are the SSRI exposed, the average of the SSRI exposed kids. They're certainly normal. If you saw this kid and did a test, it would be a normal test. But we were seeing a similar, you know, relatively subtle, but an effect that has been reported in the literature, particularly by uh, Regina Casper and others. So we um, have begun to look at a couple things. One is, are those kids the same kids that have neonatal adaptation signs, and if so, what signs? The other interesting thing is they are not different at 78 months. And, and one of the things about this study is that we had uh, a pediatric service that we worked with in Pittsburgh where the pediatrician was gung-ho on developmental support for any kid that looked a little bit off. And so, you know, I, I often wonder now, uh, is this just the natural evolution? Are these kinds of things malleable? Or is that intervention what made the difference? So uh, another interesting issue, and something I think you're, you're working on here as well, is what about newborn brains? What do we know about uh, SSRI exposure and or prenatal depression exposure on newborn brains? So this is a, a study from UNC in which they looked at um, white matter microstructure and brain volumes with structural MRIs. And what they found was interesting in that here the SSRI exposed neonates had widespread changes in white matter microstructure, not other global areas, but white matter microstructure and the MDD exposed 
fetuses did not have that. So we began to wonder, well, is this potentially connected to this psychomotor difficulty that we're seeing later, and or do some of these kids have what we would think about more as neurobehavioral teratogenicity, in other words, that there is an effect of the drug on the brain structure, not a cardiac defect, but a brain structure effect, and how common is that? So, uh, and, and another question, again, from investigators here. What about this incredibly vulnerable period in development we call puberty? What about prenatal exposure to various agents that have major effect on the serotonergic system? What about during puberty? What do we see then? Might there be a higher risk for early onset depression? We know that for exposure to major depression that exists, but what about uh, for SSRIs. So this is the incidence of major depression through 14.9 years. And what I really like about this is, is pa panel A is um, comparison of SSRI exposure to psychiatric disorder without med. And you can see a hazard ratio here, just under two. And this I like, exposed prenatally to SSRI and SSRI discontinuation, meaning that both of the groups had an SSRI. They elected to take it, so they're probably more similar. And this one discontinued before pregnancy, but a very similar hazard ratio, which again, I think is really important because it makes us look not at these isolated cross-sectional things that this literature uh, typically involves, but a more long-term look at exposure. And I would have to say we are really a model. You know, for SSRIs, we've done so much work in this area. Other than anticonvulsants, we're really a model for how to study these agents. So conceptually, SSRIs and MDD both affect maternal, fetal, and infant outcomes in different ways. And so when we have an individual in front of us, our challenge is take all of this information and figure out, well, how does it apply to the individual and how does she value those outcomes, she and her family, how do they value those outcomes? But the, the problem that, that I've been intrigued with is how do we optimally treat pregnant women? What's the answer to the question about if we treat women fully to remission, are the outcomes better? And I, I got into this because this, these are data from my own study. These are the Hamilton 17 items. And what you see is for the control comparison group, no SSRI, no depression, low scores with some variability. The women treated continuously with SSRIs, low scores, but a lot of variability and not here. And these are the women who were untreated. So what we're looking at in most of the studies that say we're looking at SSRI exposure, it's very likely that we're looking at SSRIs and a distribution of depression scores, probably a mixed. We're looking at some mix of depression with the SSRIs as well. And so I uh, think that the reason that in that other study about recurrence, that 25%, 26% of women had a recurrence in pregnancy, I think it's due to the fact that we don't know how to treat these women. So we began to look at levels of fluoxetine. So this has 20, 30, 36 weeks. This is across pregnancy. Here are the average concentrations of fluoxetine across pregnancy. You can see them begin to dip. By delivery, they're very low. So that if this woman needs this amount of fluoxetine to stay well, she may become symptomatic during that time frame. And that's what we were seeing. This is a, um, a 2D6 uh, metabolized drug. That hepatic system is dramatically increased in its activity in pregnancies. Same thing here for citalopram. So the blue is escitalopram, and you can see again declining as you move towards delivery. This is sertraline, probably the drug we most commonly use, induced by estradiol. So here you have 20 weeks. You can see this really gets low here. And in fact, around 20 weeks, we get a lot of calls from people saying, she was on sertraline doing well, and now she's, it's not working. What drug do I change her to? And the thing, don't, don't change the drug. Go up on the dose. This is not appreciated by the vast majority of practitioners, but it, it, it really is an important issue in treating pregnant women, and I think why in that study 25% of the women became ill. 
So we now have a center grant to look at, uh, we call it Optimum, Optimal Medication Management for Mothers with Depression. And we are looking at, we're seeing women, enrolling women with depression, not bipolar disorder, doing genetic uh, typing and storing DNA for more definitive typing. We capture concentrations and dose ratios all across pregnancy. These patients are not managed by us, but in the community. So we are capturing how often it is that the levels drop and the women become ill. The practitioners do get reports of their uh, monitoring scores. And we're looking at you know, what's the failure of drug efficacy if the doses aren't changed. And do we see any new onset adverse effects in pregnancy? Unlikely, because the vast majority of the enzymes increase in pregnancy, so the levels go down. And we have uh, efficacy outcomes. I'll say something that we're observing, and that is, before the women suffer a recurrent depression in pregnancy, what we're seeing is the GAD scores go up. It's as if the anxiety scores go up first, and then the depression scores go up. So that's kind of an interesting uh, finding that we're looking to see if it continues. And I mentioned we have a um, separate protocol to look at the babies. So winding down, um, these are some clinical uh, suggestions, points that I wanted to put in that are more related to how I practice. Uh, I'm often asked, what is the best drug for a pregnant woman, best antidepressant? And my response is always the one that's effective for her. Uh, you don't want to be changing medications. Often the, the responses are hard won. Now, if she's not doing well, you know, some adjust, adjustment, you know, helping her have uh, an effective treatment is important. Documenting exposures is important because if there is some negative outcome, the drug that everybody remembers is the SSRIs, not the three other drugs she took in pregnancy. I recommend tracking depression and particularly anxiety across pregnancy every month and using that tool to educate the patient that she needs to let you know if she's beginning to feel like her syndrome, her mood syndrome is uh, recurring. I'm often asked, well, should I get plasma levels of uh, SSRIs across pregnancy? I think until we develop uh, some kind of dosing algorithm from the work we're doing now, it, it, it is um, sufficient and certainly beyond what most people do to monitor monthly and watch for the need for a dose increase. Uh, postpartum, the dose has to be tapered. Occasionally, though, the women want to continue that dose that they had in pregnancy because they're worried about postpartum depression. So when to take her back to her pre-pregnancy dose is, again, an individual decision. Pregnancy exposure is much greater than through breast milk. And I often get patients saying, you know, All right, I'm comfortable taking the medication in pregnancy, but I don't want to take it in breastfeeding. And, and the transmission, the degree of transmission is so low through breast milk that there's a major educational campaign through the uh, Pediatric Clinical Trials Network, who's doing a big study now, which we're involved in on drugs and breastfeeding. And then providing resources, mother to baby, which I spoke about, and postpartum support international, they're really important. So now I'm going to talk about the right questions, which you can debate are really the right questions. So how do we manage patients who become pregnant on a particular medication. Typically, they taper the medication, and we watch them for getting to get sick. One of the things that, that um, is interesting is a, a pilot study they did with Robin Jarrett on doing CBT during the taper. We call it CBT boot camp. So making sure that women had skills and maintenance psychotherapy, is that a way that we could reduce the risk of recurrence without medication? What about light therapy? You have a strong light therapy program here. Could one implement light, which is effective for non-seasonal depression during the taper and maintain those women as well? Again, rather than just watching them to see if they get sick. Um, how do we manage dosing? We talked about that. Uh, the other concern I have is this idea of this mixed literature. So when we look at patients who in the group were treated with SSRIs. Again, what we're looking at is SSRIs and variable levels of control of the illness. So my interest has been in looking at remitted women with depression and, and the advantages that I hope are true for those women. So 
how do we also begin to move away from population level data so that we can match those findings more specifically to the women that we see and their offspring. So personalization of care. We need to move forward with that. Pregnancy exposure to SSRIs and all drugs will inevitably occur. It is never going to happen that there will be no exposures. So we know that there's a lot of developmental plasticity. You know, even from the old literature on severe preterm birth where the outcomes were more dependent on the environment in which the infant went compared to anything else related to the um, infant's uh, um, physical status. Uh, we know that environment's critically important. How do we support that developmental plasticity in the event of exposure that we can't avoid? How malleable are those outcomes? So just like we found that those motor findings around six months to a year disappeared, how malleable are these findings, which is certainly important to parents in terms of discovering the level of worry. and. We've been thinking again on these more risk kinds of concepts. What about positive concepts, right? What about stress reduction and management to improve outcomes? We know folic acid, for example, prenatally reduces the risk for neural tube defects, and the neurologists typically use it in the face of anti-epileptic drug treatment, and there's some evidence that, in fact, it's involved in the pathway through which lithium leads to cardiac defects. So pediatric cardiologists now recommending folic acid supplementation for lithium-treated pregnant women as well. What about uh, the work in Denver on phosphatidylcholine supplementation, which uh, improves a, <clears throat> an early measure of infant uh, habituation in cases in uh, phosphatidylcholine-treated pregnant women compared to placebo-treated women, a benefit for their offspring. And in Pittsburgh and elsewhere, there's work on omega-3 fatty acids and potential to mitigate stress in, in moms. So, can we see this as not only a period of vulnerability, but a period of opportunity? And with that, I'll um, leave you with this statement, mental health, fundamental to health. Thank you. So we do Q&A now, is that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kathy, thank you for that. Uh, you know, masterful sort of overview and provocative discussion about what's a, uh, increasingly important uh, but inadequately addressed uh, clinical and public health issue. So ACOG in, I think, 2015 called for not mandatory but highly recommended screening of yeah. all, you know, uh, uh, peripartum uh, women. Um, how many places do you think that's been uh, implemented? So uh, or, or I know. To what, to what degree? To yeah. Uh, 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 so I know that there are four states now that require screening, Illinois being one. So, and there are a number of uh, policy advocates for policy, like in California and in Pennsylvania, to, to implement that in state. So there's a big push to do that. But my general sense is. Uh, in, air, in places where it's not legally required, it is very much up to the uh, OB administrations. And so uh, in academic settings, there is uh, a fair amount of screening, often postpartum, not prenatal. There's still a focus on postpartum depression rather than perinatal depression. There is a lot of resistance in non-academic settings. And uh, in fact, I just got a call last week from a group trying to implement it in pediatric settings because the AAP recommends it as well because it recognizes postpartum depression as an important environmental exposure for the infant. So the, the call I got was, Pediatricians don't want to do it because there's no place to put the score. They don't have a chart on the mother. The mother's not the patient. And what if she says she's suicidal? And that is often the resistance. So I got a call asking, you know, can we take uh, 
can we provide data on how valid the EPDS is without item 10, the suicide item, which I refuse to do, because it's bending to let's put your head in the sand as opposed to let's appropriately evaluate these patients. So uh, there is still a debate on whether screening is appropriate or not, uh, a, a long-term debate. The debate for pro-screening is winning out, but there are still a lot of detractors. The main problem is, I think, a legitimate one, that if you, if you ask, are there enough mental health professionals, and particularly perinatal mental health professionals out there to handle one out of seven women in the perinatal period, the answer is no. So what's evolved is um, collaborative care models. So the maternal fetal medicine mentee that I have has developed a collaborative care model with support from the hospital within our OB service. And that's been very helpful. We expect the OBs to manage them, but there's an initial consultation available, which is important. Then you have Massachusetts, which has um, uh, McPap for Moms, which is a statewide consultation line, local referral sources, a very wonderful statewide program to manage perinatal depression that's a, a national model. So progress, but not enough, Jeff. Comments, Betsy. Thank you, Kathy, for such a wonderful and, and clear talk on obviously a, a topic close to my heart. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you about um, comorbidity. We talked a little bit about yeah. this last night. And what we observe is in our um, more private population, anxiety disorder, anxiety comorbidity is the norm. And yeah. it's really an exception when you have some a patient who has pure depression without comorbid anxiety. In the clinic, 90% of the patients we see in the Medicaid clinic setting have trauma. Yeah. And, you know, we can treat the depression and the trauma and the, you know, the complex trauma from early childhood on is really the norm. And so I wanted to get your perspective on how this fits into what I think is your larger message about how do we optimize uh, women's health in the perinatal period? And, and how does it affect even the data that we're seeing since, the, you know, we don't really typically look at trauma, for example, yeah. as, a, as a comorbidity? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. We, uh, in the study that I showed when I talked about the, my disappointment about recurrent depression, we also looked at uh, the diagnoses on the skid that were comorbid. And you're right, 70% of those women with depression had a comorbid anxiety disorder, usually GAD, PTSD, some OCD, but um, a comorbid anxiety disorder that they often said heralded or was way onsetted before, which is why I've kind of moved to this um, uh, menarchal program, this puberty program, because I think these illnesses are, you know, longitudinal illnesses. The other interesting thing is this issue of the anxiety score going up before the depression score, whether in, in asking people to track depression scores, we're really missing some early opportunities. Then the greater issue is, if we're viewing these as depression, although some people have begun using perinatal uh, mood and anxiety, PMAD, as the disorders, are we really missing the, uh, a couple things? The opportunity to intervene with trauma and grief. And uh, we were talking uh, last night about the last conference that, well, two conferences ago, we asked Kathy Shear to come talk about trauma and grief and integrating it into some of the work we were doing because it was just so common. So should we have a more personalized approach? I think that's exactly right. So just like just screening for depression, we ran into this issue of, oh, gee, they have bipolar disorder. Well, there's OG, oh, they have grief and trauma, and they're not really going to respond particularly well to the treatments that we outline only for depression. So one of the points that I didn't put up was, what do we do with treatment refractory perinatal depression? Very little information on that. We borrow from the general literature, but I think you're, you're absolutely right. And in the Optimom study, we do the ACE uh, estimation, because not only is it relevant to mental health. It's, you know, as you know, relevant to overall health. And I think that's a, a critical part of how we can shape this 
data set so that we can bring it down to how do we personalize? Is there an algorithm for type this type one person with perinatal and this type two person? We also have a subset of women with eating disorders, you know, depression and eating disorders. We know that if you have an eating disorder, you're more likely to get perinatal depression. So I think there are these subgroups that we've largely ignored and uh, love to work with you on that, actually. <laughs> I just wanted to um, ask uh, Jay to be thinking about uh, making a comment because, you know, the SRI effects on the fetus are obviously the big concern. But uh, while you're formulating your thoughts, uh, Steve? Thank you, Kat. Thank you, Kathy. And I think Sandy would have loved the way you introduced the talk because it's always about asking the right question. Hmm. Let me ask you a question. The significant other made it to the last line yep. on the last line of the last line. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a very difficult time. Um, if a woman is alone there making these decisions without a partner, it's a lot of material for us to digest and so forth. Um, how many times is the other interested? How many times do they come? Does it impact the outcome? Is <clears throat> it important? Is there a way of educating them to be an important uh, support during this time? This is a great question. So uh, my colleague, Sheehan Fisher, who is in my program and runs our father's clinic, would have would be right there with you going, Kathy, Kathy, you need to do. So he actually runs a, a, so let me back up. The way I do my evaluations, always invite a person who is a significant other. About half the time they bring the husband, about half the time they bring a sister, mother, friend. So it's variable who they bring. Sometimes they don't bring anybody, but they're always invited. And if nobody comes with that person, I always extend an opportunity for a phone conversation. Because uh, not as much recently due to this, but in the past, there's the, yeah, you know, I know I decided that I was going to take that medication, but my husband told me I couldn't take it. So, so we definitely, that, that is an issue. We also find um, couples where there's couples depression, so that we have situations where, in fact, the couple comes for treatment, sometimes pharmacotherapy, sometimes couples treatment and pharmacotherapy, sometimes just couples treatment, that the couple comes because you're right, we've really done a lot of ignoring of the fathers and we really see this whole area through the lens of the woman. You're absolutely right. So uh, Sheehan uh, has uh, two projects. One is to work with the parents of infants who have just received the call that their infant screened positive for cystic fibrosis. And so he works with those triads uh, or families on helping them deal with all of the things that one needs to do to keep a child with CF functioning optimally. But the other area that he has just begun with, with some grant funding is a training program in which he, um, so, so the moms are in depression treatment, and what he is doing is adding on a component for fathers that has to do with four sessions of negotiating with your partner about the needs of your partner and the baby, what's special about this time. He uh, gets into issues of masculinity with the guys, um, assesses for depression, substance use. So it's a preparation for fatherhood protocol. And then he has a session after birth as well. So we're testing to see, uh, to, to, to do what you're suggesting, which is, you know, the, the father's something other than a sperm donor, that there really is an important role for him, and he can be an incredible therapeutic ally in this process. So he's begun to test that, and he, he would be shaking his finger at me as well. No, Kathy? <laughs> well, I'm sort of being a little facetious, but no, you're absolutely right. Fathers are uh, very important allies. And not so much with this population, but with our more severely ill bipolar population, it's much more common to have the fathers come in, to have the fathers 
uh, take responsibility for mood monitoring, particularly for those women who lose insight when they begin to become ill. And we also uh, typically give them some sort of a rescue med that they're in charge of, so they don't have to run around, you know, to the pharmacy if we want to prescribe something. There's a plan for rescue, and in more in those severely ill women, uh, fathers are just indispensable. So it's a good point. Thank you for raising it. Jay. Uh, Hi, Jay. How are you? <laughs> so, um, okay. So, um, thank you, Jeff, for inviting me, and thank you, Kathy, for a great talk. Um, so many thoughts I have, um, <laughs> but uh, first of all, I think you're asking absolutely the right questions. I mean, it's been our experience too that the there's been an under recognition of maternal depression or maternal psychopathology as a contributor to all sorts of um, outcome problems with the offspring. And um, I think that's been missed in a lot of these studies which have ascribed adverse um, consequences to SSRI exposure yeah. relative to autism or ADHD. Those have just not been, to my understanding, borne out when um, you take into account maternal psychopathology. Um, the, the other thing, so I think, um, you know, the question that we continue to have is um, what is the role, you know, is, are the SSRI usage during pregnancy a proxy for something else that's going on in the, uh, in the mother-child dyad that's um, mm -hmm. really, again, being falsely ascribed to SSRI? Certainly we have, yeah. uh, with my colleagues, found uh, evidence that things begin to go differently in adolescence, but really nothing before that. And the, so I, I guess I have one more comment and then I have a question, <laughs> which is that uh, obviously the reason we got into this was because of our work with uh, rodents. And there's a long history of what SSRIs or other antidepressants are doing to rodent brain development if they are administered early enough in life. And um, the thing that we've been working on is to what degree is this phylogenetically conserved? Is what's happening in our rodent studies have any relationship to what's happening in humans? And I, I think that um, we still don't know the answer to that, but I, I do think that there is biological plausibility to believe that there might be something very similar going on. And uh, we think we're honing in a little bit on what the mechanism is of what's going on in the rodents. And to the best we can ascertain, those same mechanisms would be viable in uh, a human fetal brain. Um, but if the mouse work is telling us anything, I, I think it's going to ultimately inform what you're going after, which is better clinical uh, management and more informed clinical management. So we know that dose matters quite a bit. We know the mechanism of action matters quite a bit. And we know the timing of the exposure matters quite a bit. And to the degree that we can eventually fill in those blanks, um, I, I think you're, we can help contribute to that conversation. So my question is, um, <coughs> how do you, where do you think we are in terms of disambiguating, for lack of a better word, the relative contribution of maternal um, depression during pregnancy versus the postpartum period? And is there uh, mm -hmm. one period or the other um, that you think is more important vis-a-vis um, -vis the outcome of a uh, child? Yeah, good question. Where, where do I think we are? Um, so uh, just reflecting, say, the first 20 years of this work, um, say till about 10 years ago, I think it was incredibly frustrating to be arguing about, wait a minute, there are factors that come along with depression that impact. And I've been very happy with some of the papers like Krista's paper that show that, that it's disease-related factors rather than the SSRIs that account for some of this, uh, some of the effect on reproductive outcomes. Uh, I think that uh, another area that adds to some of the ambiguity is a different take on 
not only um, depression and outcomes related to poor reproductive outcomes, but depression and the risk for obstetrical problems. So for example, we're now working on, uh, in, in part of the uh, Obstetric Fetal Pharmacology Research Network, we're doing a study to look at pravastatin prevention of recurrent preeclampsia. And we have a depression measure in this. It's a, it's a dose-ranging safety and efficacy study to frame a larger clinical trial. But the other thing we're seeing is that the depression it, it, it's the depression and then these things, gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, that also have devastating effects on the fetus and newborn as well. So one of the, the this theme I keep coming back to is, would you, if those patients were treated for the depression, would those risks be less as well rather than using pravastatin? which is being used for its anti-inflammatory effects, not its anti-cholesterol effects. So I think that's another area that is still kind of ambiguous. I don't have any question at all that SSRI exposure across pregnancy has effects in the brain. I, I have no question that that happens. But I also you mean, have the no you mean the fetal brain? Yeah, fetal brain, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, oh, sorry, did I not? Okay. SSRI across pregnancy has effects in the fetal brain. Thank you, Jeff. And that depression has effects in the fetal brain as well. And, and I think the issue is it's probably the effects are different for different individuals, and we don't know how to parse that out yet. I mean, we're looking at different genetic markers. We're looking at um, all kinds of uh, markers in our uh, Optimum study, but my guess is that that what we need to do is figure out which moms are going to have those negative effects because not all kids do badly. And most of the kids do pretty well for either exposure. So I, I think we're not very far. I'm encouraged that we are beginning to at least ask these questions. But um, I'm also concerned that you know, it's, these questions are really being asked in sessions like this. And if we get out to, what are the opinions and views of most mental health professionals? These kinds of ideas are not there, and that there's still a lot of knee-jerk, stop the drug, she's pregnant. And you know we continue to see those patients admitted. So I look forward to what you folks are doing to help disentangle the, the exposures. I, I still, though, Notice that every paper in this area still has in it something I think is critical, which is related to this, which is the decision about whether to treat has to be based on that particular woman's choice and her illness characteristics. And it's got to be an individual decision. So what Jay is referring to is, you know, there's all this stuff out here, all this <laughs> stuff and you've got Mrs. Jones in your office, and what she wants to know is, well, all those risks are fine, but what's my risk? And that's what we don't know yet. That's what makes care hard. Well, just to follow up on the treatment question, one, um, uh, how effective is CBT or IPT or any form of psychotherapy for uh, peripartum depression? And then secondly, what do you think of this uh, SAGE pharmaceutical study with uh, allopregnenolone? <sighs> okay, so <clears throat> how effective is... Uh, some psychotherapy versus meds for perinatal depression. So um, Mike O'Hara and um, so Iowa with Mike and a group at Brown have a paper that they've presented at conferences. It's not published yet, but they compared pill placebo, sertraline and placebo, and IPT in postpartum women, not, not pregnant, but postpartum women. And they basically found what uh, we have been so unfortunate to find in clinical trials and that there was no difference between the three cells for postpartum depression, although on one of the secondary measures there was an advantage for uh, the sertraline cell. So that's the only formal comparison that I'm aware of. Uh, I think, uh, you know, what I think is another under-researched area is let's look at these non-pharmacologic treatments for depression. 
We use psychotherapy often, particularly in this context of, well, let's not just stop the med and let them get sick. Let's try something. But the other area that I think is incredibly under-investigated is bright morning light therapy. So we use a lot of bright morning light therapy for women who uh, decide that they don't want to continue medications in pregnancy. It worked out. Um, we started with Meg Spinelli and Mike Terman ages ago. And there was one randomized trial. We we have tried to get an American trial done, cannot get it funded by NIMH. So what we're doing is changing it to a circadian rhythm regulation study and going to NICHD. But I, I think that's incredibly under-researched, as are these other kinds of nutritional interventions that might be useful. But there doesn't seem to be a lot of political will at NIMH, at least, to fund those kinds of, of studies. Uh, and sage oh, to sage. So, <clears throat> so uh, Sam Meltzer Brody is a good colleague, a good friend and colleague who is the PI on that study, and I did not participate in those studies. I recruited so her to UNC, so I don't say anything bad about her. <laughs> huh? I'm sorry. I said I recruited her to UNC. So don't say anything oh, yeah, bad about right, her. Oh yeah, yeah. She's she's fabulous. The initial protocol was 60 hours of intravenous allopregnanolone, which was uh, pretty prohibitive and, you know, needed to be done on an inpatient setting. So I didn't participate. They've moved on to <clears throat> an oral preparation. The data from those studies looks very promising. I think so. I, I'm really excited about. Uh, the, the rapidity with which that agent seems to reduce fairly severe initial depression scores, and it seems to be sustained at least for a brief period. So I think it's potentially a very exciting new finding. The, the one thought that I had uh, when I first looked at that protocol was they included women with postpartum depression out to 6 or 12 months. So it's not really the postpartum onset biologic hormone withdrawal depression that we think about as you know biologically based postpartum depression. So as I understand it, they've now begun to use allopregnanolone for depression more generally in an oral formulation, but I haven't seen data on that. So I think it's an exciting new finding. So, so you, you believe the data so far in, uh, for postpartum depression? So this is allopregnanolone, which is- I do, is yeah which is it. administered in a 60-hour uh, continuous infusion on an inpatient basis for women with PPD. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's striking, dr dramatic, and uh, relatively rapid. Um, so the one work. question is, does it work really? And then secondly, does it generalize beyond you know, PPD? So yeah, and I think I think it's like any new treatment. They had a lot of difficulty getting the initial 60-hour drug placebo data published, and uh, because they only had like four patients, but they did so well, they decided to move to the randomized trial. And then the randomized trial now is published. But you know, there are very few subjects, so whether it's going to be something that is generalizable, I think it's still a question. It, it sort of reminds me of our pravastatin data where we've done a 10 and a 20 milligram sample. We have 20 in each, and it's going to be subjected to a large-scale clinical trial, which I think is, is going to be the next step for the, uh, what do they call it, Brexanolone is the name that they're calling their product, which is the allopregnanolone. So I think it's fascinating data. I, I have elected to wait and see if it really works in a general population. Jay, you should see if it, uh, given concurrently to rodents with SRIs, whether it mitigates the uh, the, uh, the behavioral effects you see. Interesting. Interesting. So at any rate, um, uh, we're over our time. Oh. I've consumed more than I should have in terms of it. Uh, any final burning question before we adjourn? I got a cookie. Uh, Ralph Horton just left, and he asked me to ask you, uh, what about lithium? He says there's a big European study that su suggests it's the best drug. And also, uh, what about helping with sleep, oh. which is a common problem with people who gain the 20 pounds in pregnancy? Okay, so 
the, the, this is the, I think the study that you're referring to, this large pharmacoepidemiologic study of lithium. And I uh, am of the opinion as well that lithium is incredibly underutilized for patients with bipolar disorder. And, you know, as I see, sadly, suicides on other agents, I worry about, you know, again, the, the, the relatively low prescribing rate for lithium and the fact that we know that on a population level, it, it reduces suicide. So this is uh, the study that was just published in the New England Journal, and it is a look at uh, the rate of cardiac defects associated with lithium, but uh, I think that this latter point is the most important point. Magnitude of the effect was smaller than previously postulated. So here are the, the risks by dose. I worry about presenting this risk, so a 1.11 for a cardiac defect for a low dose for 900, which is still a low dose, and uh, over three for 900. I worry about that because, as you know, there's not a precise relationship between the, the serum level, which is what the infant sees, and I think it's incredibly important to keep the moms well. So. Uh, here we have cardiac defects for unexposed, lamotrigine exposed. These were the comparator groups. And then these are the, the risks associated with lithium treatment. Still very, very, very low. And the point that I would like to make is, is also in this paper is here are lithium levels pre-pregnancy. Then uh, this is very light, so it's hard to see. But you see first trimester, second, and third trimester. Uh, and then postpartum. So this is a, a big population PK study that was done. And what's interesting is the investigators focused on, gee, these levels are going up. So perhaps we need to monitor these patients weekly during this time. So what we're finding is this, that in fact, the, the recommendations for lithium monitoring pregnancy are all over the place. What we find is what I wish you could see these dots more clearly, is that the first trimester, that GFR begins to really go up. And in fact, we see the levels dropping rapidly first trimester. They're relatively stable in the second trimester. So we monitor closely here at least once a month, if not more, and follow symptoms carefully. We don't monitor much here unless a patient has a clinical change. And we have not had to change the dosing very much here either. So we, we actually have a formal lithium pharmacokinetic study with 24-hour with sampling pre three times in pregnancy and postpartum to build on these data and, and do more, uh, more specific dosing in pregnancy for lithium. So that's the, the latest paper for the lithium, which is an incredibly important paper. But I mean, our recommendations is again, first trimester is the time when the levels are declining quickly, less problematic second, and you know, there's a big scatter here, but we don't often change levels here. If a woman has some signs of toxicity though, it would, it would be important to think about, gee, maybe she's in this, in a group of women where the level's higher than she can tolerate. Does that make sense? Well, we've got to get you up to lunch oh. in the residence, but I want to thank you for a great talk and for all you've contributed to the field. Thank you.